Pushing back the shadows, support and awareness for mental health. Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the Pushing Back the Shadows podcast. My name is Alex Davis, I'm the founder of Pushing Back the Shadows. So today I wanted to look a little bit at my journey and a little bit of something that makes up a lot of my coping mechanism. Now, previously I have talked about masks, how we do find that we do put a mask on to hide what's really going on inside. It's something that we do as a bit of a coping mechanism, it keeps people at bay, it stops them asking those awkward questions that we don't know the answers to. Because do you ever find that? Somebody asks you why you get depressed, or why you react in a certain way, and you just sit there and you go, uh, I don't know. Because sometimes we don't know why it happens. You know, some people will say to me, um, when I'm in a depressive spiral, they'll say, well, well, what happened? What triggered it? And I'll go, do you know what? I haven't got a clue. I really haven't got a clue. And it's something that I find is quite common. We put the mask on so that we don't have to answer those questions, so that we don't actually have to, um, to try and explain something that we don't understand. Now, going off of that, I want to tell you a little bit about my mask today. So, this particular episode is entitled The Joker, because it's something that I find is actually quite a bit of a... a bit of something that I find is part of my mask, but also something that I have a slightly different spin on. Now, those of you, when you hear of The Joker, you will automatically think of the character out of Batman. Um, now, I tend to think of Heath Ledger, but some of you might think more of Mark Hamill, as he voices the, the Joker in the video games. And I have to be honest, when I, um, well, I'm the cartoons, not just the video games, but when I was playing through one of the Batman video games, I wanted to know who one of the other characters was voiced by. And it was then that I noticed it was Mark Hamill, and being a, a big Star Wars fan that I am, it was like, really? Seriously? <gasps> because I, I didn't have a clue. But the Joker specifically is quite a, a mad character, isn't he? He describes himself in, uh, in The Dark Knight as an agent of chaos. He brings in that little bit of anarchy, and it's fun for him. He's not the guy with the plan, he's the guy who destroys the plan. He shows people for what they really are. And it's something, in a, a weird and roundabout way, it's something that I can relate to. I don't go and destroy the plan, I don't go and show people for what they really are, but I, I can kind of empathise with the name, the Joker. He's portrayed as having a bit of a sense of humour, and that is a big part of my mask, my sense of humour. It's one of the biggest coping mechanisms that I use, and it's one of the biggest parts of my mask. A couple of people have said that they had no idea that I would be the one who was depressed, because I was always laughing, I was always joking. I would try and make people smile. Whether it's jokes that I'm making up on my own, or whether it's jokes that I've pinched off other people like Tim Vine, because uh, I quite like the one-liners, the play on words. Um, regardless of whether it's that or whether it's, you know, me just messing about, I find that I am a joker. Not necessarily the joker, because that would be quite scary, but definitely a joker. And it's something that I almost draw a bit of inspiration from. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to become a homicidal maniac who goes about destroying things, blowing up hospitals, slicing people to pieces and all this. That's, um, <laughs> that's not my style. I'll leave that for the video games. But the joke side of it, that is something I do. I mean, recently I was on Twitter and I was talking with a couple of people, um, a couple of people on there, and it was something that I could... Um, just let my humour go with. You know, they were talking about ponies. You know, this is after a long string of conversations where you had Star Trek meeting Star Wars, meeting Doctor Who, meeting Big Bang, and then one of them said that we had to bring ponies into it, um, which, you know, I thought that was quite a foul idea. 
I was just having a bit of a mare about it. I know, I know, I'm getting off the, the main topic here. But it's one of those things, I mean, you get an idea there for, for how bad some of my jokes are. I mean, I just ended up saddled with all the horse jokes there. Um, and yes, I'll keep going on those jokes until my voice is a little hoarse. I'm going to stop there. But you get the idea. It's something that I've developed, something that I am getting quite good at. Not necessarily getting good at the funny jokes, but I'm certainly getting good at telling the jokes and coming up with jokes and one-liners on a quick basis. And it's something that I use to cope. Why? Well, if I can make you smile, there's a chance that I can convince myself I'm not actually as bad as my brain tells me. And if I can make you smile, perhaps I can make me smile too. Humour diffuses situations. Unless, of course, people don't have a sense of humour, in which case it can exasperate them. But, nine times out of ten, it will diffuse a situation. And that's... It's something that I find is... quite an important thing, for me particularly. Quite an important thing. So why else am I like the Joker? Well, we shall have a look at that. You're listening to Pushing Back the Shadows. I've talked about humour then. I've talked about how the jokes form a big part of my mask. And realistically, okay, the Joker isn't necessarily a funny character. I mean, he does tell the jokes, he does, you know... Like, the scene sticks out in, in my head for The Dark Knight when Heath Ledger was in it, and he's holding the string to the um, to all the explosives that he's wired to himself, and he says, Now, now, let's not blow this out of proportion. You know, and then you've got the other Joker in, um, like, the computer games and the cartoon, the Mark Hamill version, who, again, was really told quite a few jokes. But that's not all that I got from the Joker. That's not one of the things that, that I would associate him with necessarily. Not the only thing at any rate. Now, some of what I'm about to tell you comes from comes from my old blog. Uh, before I started pushing back the shadows, I ran a different blog. One for friends and family. So I'd be able to update them with how things were going. Some of the things that were going through my head. It was... It was what came before Pushing Back the Shadows. Think of it like Pushing Back the Shadows' birth, if you like. And on that blog, uh, so this would be going back to about the 30th of October uh, 2016, I wrote a post about the Joker. And I did talk about how the, the humour, how the jokes are kind of my coping mechanism. One thing that I do to get through. And... Then I went on to talk about how I'd been thinking a bit about the Joker, uh, more specifically Heath Ledger's portrayal of the Joker, and I was on YouTube watching a clip of some of his iconic film moments, um, and there was something in it, and I'm sure those of you who've seen the film, you might have heard of this at some point, the scene where he's going to blow up the hospital... And he, he walks away, and you've got a few of the little explosions going off, and then nothing. And the Joker kind of turns around, he looks at the remote, and he's shaking it, and he's pushing the button. And then all of a sudden you see the the fizz of the explosion start up as it really goes, and he runs for the bus. And in the original cut, that wasn't meant to be there. Something had gone wrong with the pyrotechnics, Heath Ledger had improvised... And they kept it in the film. Another thing that I, I think of is things like um, when he turns around he goes, Do you want to know how I got these scars? I know, rubbish impersonation. But it's something that that I thought of, and I, I might have even said once or twice. It's like, well, do you know what? Do you actually want to know why I got these scars? You're quick enough to condemn them. Do you want to know why I got them? And this post really came from, and I will actually post this post up for you guys to read, so you can compare to where I was then and where I am now. Um, this post, there was a lot of darkness in there. 
a lot of darkness. One thing um, that I was talking about, I was chatting with somebody, and while we were messaging, I suddenly said that a couple of people had made me think of the Joker. And I'm sure those of you who've seen the film will remember the scene where he's in the hospital with Harvey Dent. And um, the Joker says, you know what? You know what I've noticed? Nobody panics when things go according to plan. Even if the plan is horrifying. If tomorrow I tell the press that, like, a gangbanger will get shot or a truckload of soldiers will be blown up, nobody panics because it's all part of the plan. But when I say that one little old mare will die, well, everybody loses their minds. And I can relate. At that point, I was supposed to be somewhere. I was supposed to go and see somebody. And as still happens, I really did not feel able to go. And yet again, I was sitting there saying, oh, I've let people down because I wasn't where I was supposed to be. But the problem was that nobody noticed. Nobody noticed. The week before, I'd been at my parents. Um, so they live down in Somerset, which is well away from me. Um, and so people had known that I wasn't going to be around. They'd known I was at my parents'. The following week, when I'm not good and I'm not where I'm supposed to be, they still assume that I'm not there. They don't bother. And it, it's really like a bad joke. It's been like that for a long time. So this post does continue on in that vein. And it, it did make me think, you know, when I'm not supposed to be there, no one thinks of me when I don't turn up because it's all part of the plan. But then when I'm supposed to be somewhere and I'm not, where well, everybody kind of loses their minds. And it really talked a lot more about some of these, um, some of the ways that people react to mental health. Some of the ways that they talk or don't talk to people who are struggling. Because the thing I found is that as soon as they realise it's a long term problem, as soon as they realise there is no quick fix, they lose interest. They stop putting the work in. And then, as I've mentioned in my post, the onus, which I shall also link to you guys, they then put the onus on us. And they say, well, you don't get in touch. You don't talk. You don't turn up. So why should I bother? Now, towards the end of the post, the, um, the image that I could find that really, really went well with this, because as you guys will have seen, I do like my images on my posts. Um was the Joker saying, well, why should I apologise for the monster I have become? No one ever apologised for making me this way. And in chats with various people, especially with concerning this particular group that do not make any effort, people say, well, are you sure you're not being too hard on them? Are you sure they're not trying? People are trying, people are doing this, people are doing that. And it's like, well, no, they're not. They are not making the effort that they are claiming to be. It's like those people who are painted out to be the golden child, when actually they're not. They're nowhere near. So that's another reason why I am like the Joker. Not just because I tell the jokes. Not just because I have the scars, which in that post I did say I've got about 300, but... Now it's well, well over that number. Um, but because I do feel that disconnection, even today, it winds me up. And I'm going to look into that a little bit more in just a second. Enable Pushing Back the Shadows to continue supporting people in the mental health community, their friends and their family. By pledging just one dollar a month, you could help us to continue supporting people with depression, with anxiety, with bipolar and other mental illnesses. You can also unlock exclusive rewards, behind the scenes, uh, sneak previews of upcoming posts and much, much more. So head over to www.patreon.com forward slash Alex Davis PBTS to find out more.
So really when it becomes apparent that it's a long-term problem and there is no quick fix, people lose interest. They support for a little bit or they come and they go whenever they feel like it. But there is very little constant continual support in the world nowadays for mental health. I found that a lot of my friends were great for the first couple of weeks. And then, like somebody had flicked a switch, it was a case of, well, no, no, I, I, I can't do that. I'm busy this week. I can't do this. I can't. No. And it was just excuses. And a lot of them, sadly, decided they were going to turn that round on me and say, well, do you know what? You don't make the effort. You don't come. You don't contact. You don't communicate. And the thing that I find strikes me the most about that is that with mental illness, particularly with depression, or even with anxiety, especially social anxiety, you won't be the one to contact. You won't be the one to communicate. Because you ca you feel that you can't. With anxiety, you can get yourself into a panic. I mean, I if I can avoid it, I will avoid going on the phone. Because I hate it. That could be part of what working in a call centre for a bank has done to me. But I get a minor panic every single time that phone rings. So nowadays, nine times out of ten, I either don't have my phone or it's on vibrate and I use texts only. But... I do find that I cannot use the phone. So if I can't use the phone, how am I going to get in touch with somebody? Flip that over, go on the depression side. I've got a voice, a very convincing voice inside my head saying people don't care. People are not bothered about you or your problems, so why would they want to help you? And that can be as effective as a paralyzing agent because it stops you from reaching out you think well they don't care they don't want to know and the silence then speaks volumes and you get trapped in this cycle this never-ending cycle of I have no one to talk to they don't get in touch they don't care about me I have no one to talk to they don't get in touch they don't care about me and it goes round and round and round and I've if I've said this once I said this a thousand times just one person dropping that one message can change someone's day. One person with one message can change someone's day. That's all it takes. One person. Effectively, it's a lot like um, this little poem by David McMurtry. It's a story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody and nobody. And there was an important job to be done and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realised that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have. Now there's a lot of bodies in there, but what it boils down to is that everyone is responsible here. Everybody could have sent a message. And that includes me. Absolutely, that includes me. I could have sent a message to somebody. Anybody. Doesn't matter who. But nobody got in touch. And then everybody is blaming everybody else, saying, oh, well, you don't do this, you don't do that. When, why should it be that way? Why, in the world today, with technology at our fingertips and communication being as easy as it is, should nobody be able to message? Now, the sad truth is when I actually brought this up with a couple of people, the first thing they said is that they're that busy, they can't keep in touch all the time. And they failed to miss the point because I'm not expecting messages all day, every day, you know, every hour. But the occasional one, one a week, is that so hard? And it's something that everyone can do. They say that people don't know what to say. Well, just a simple, hi, how are you doing? I've been thinking of you. That is a great conversation starter. As cliched as it sounds, it's a great conversation starter. But should we really tell somebody that we're too busy to message them? Now... 
granted I know a few people who take their time typing, but for younger people like me, it takes a minute, two minutes, it might take five minutes if you're not so good with a phone, with technology, but it's still five minutes. So you've got 24 hours in a day, seven days a week, and you can't find five minutes in that time to send somebody a message? I'm interested in knowing your thoughts here. Actually, get in touch and let me know what you think, because I find that this is a big problem in mental health. Nobody gets in touch after the initial couple of weeks, and sometimes they don't even last a couple of weeks. Granted, there are those few people who are the exception to the rule. Cheryl has been an absolutely incredible person at keeping in touch. Even when she's got a hundred other things to do, she keeps in touch. And I still think if, there's, if somebody is able to do that, why can't everybody try? Granted, we don't know what people are going through. And that in itself... That in itself is where I need to speak a little bit of leniency there, because you don't know what people are going through. They may be in hospital, they may be having to care for a relative, they may have had some other kind of family event, life event, that needs their immediate attention, and they won't be on the phone. But that's not always the case. So bear in mind there will need to be some leniency, but if it's consistent, if it's all the time. And the reason I'm telling you about this today is because it ties directly into my feelings of the Joker. This is where that harrowing void that I've described really feeds into my dark passenger. And I know that's very Dexter, but I do tend to think of it as a dark passenger. And that dark passenger is very much like the Joker. So today I've given you a little glimpse behind the mask. I've let you see something that really affects me. Something that can really feed into my depression. What about you? What do you find feeds into yours? As always, alex.davis at pushingbacktheshadows.com is where you need to send your replies um, or you can tweet me at alexdavispbts and I'd be interested in hearing your responses but I think that's all from me for today so you guys take care you have a very good day don't let my talk of the Joker and some of the darkness kind of deter you from that but I thought it would be a good idea on the Pushing Back the Shadows podcast to feature a little bit of my journey as well. So you guys take care, that's all from me for today, and I shall see you next week for the next episode of the Pushing Back the Shadows podcast. You've been listening to Pushing Back the Shadows find out more, head over to pushingbacktheshadows.com and hit subscribe to get all of our latest updates straight to your inbox. Alternatively, connect with us on Facebook, which is facebook.com forward slash alexdavispbts, or you can visit us on Twitter at alexdavispbts. Enable Pushing Back the Shadows to continue supporting people in the mental health community, their friends and their family. By pledging just $1 a month, you could help us to continue supporting people with depression, with anxiety, with bipolar and other mental illnesses. You can also unlock exclusive rewards behind the scenes, uh, sneak previews of upcoming posts and much, much more. So head over to www.patreon.com forward slash alexdavispbts to find out more.